In the year 1843, a man was born who, during his lifetime, was to have a profound effect on millions of people. His name was Russell Herman Conwell. He became a lawyer, then a newspaper editor, finally a clergyman. It was during his church career that an incident occurred which was to change his life and the lives of countless others. One day a group of young people came to Dr. Conwell at his church and asked him if he would be willing to instruct them in college courses. They wanted a college education, but lacked the money to pay for it. He told them that he'd do all he could, and as they left, a thought, an idea, began to form in Dr. Conwell's mind. He asked himself, why couldn't there be a fine college for poor but deserving young people? Well, here was a great idea, and he went to work on it at once. Almost single-handedly, Dr. Conwell raised $7 million with which he founded one of the world's leading universities. Temple University of Philadelphia. He raised the money by giving more than 6,000 lectures all over the country, and in each one of them he told the story called Acres of Diamonds. This was a true story which had affected him very deeply, just as it deeply affected his audiences. The story was the account of an African farmer who heard tales about other settlers who had made millions by discovering diamond mines. And these tales so excited the farmer that he could hardly wait to sell his farm and search for diamonds himself. So he sold the farm and spent the rest of his life wandering the vast African continent, searching unsuccessfully for the gleaming gems which brought such high prices on the markets of the world. Finally, in a fit of despondency, broke and desperate, if I remember the story, he threw himself into a river and drowned. And meanwhile, back at the ranch... The man who had bought his farm one day found a large and unusual stone in a stream which cut through the property. The stone turned out to be a great diamond of enormous value, and he then discovered that the farm was covered with them. It was to become one of the world's richest diamond mines. The first farmer had owned literally acres of diamonds, but he had sold them for practically nothing in order to look for them someplace else. If he had only taken the time to study and prepare himself, to learn what diamonds look like in their rough state, and had first thoroughly explored the land he owned, he would have found the, the millions upon millions he sought right on his own property. The thing about this story that so profoundly affected Dr. Conwell and subsequently millions of others was the idea that each of us at this moment is standing in the middle of his own acres of diamonds. If we'll only have the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the, the ground on which we now stand, the work in which we're now engaged, we'll usually find that it contains the riches we seek, whether they be financial or intangible or both. Before we go running off to what we think are greener pastures, let's make sure that our own is not just as green or perhaps even greener. You see, while we're looking at other pastures, other people are looking at ours. Someone has said, if the other pasture looks greener, maybe it's because it's getting better care. There's nothing more pitiful to my mind than the person who wastes his life running from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. No matter what your goal may be, perhaps the road to it can be found in the very thing in which you're now engaged. It wasn't until he was completely paralyzed and forced to reach into the resources of his mind that a courageous farmer got the idea of producing exceptionally good meat products on his farm. And from this idea, one of the country's largest meat packing companies was born. His farm contained acres of diamonds, too. So do all the farms. He had just never seen them before. An insurance man got the idea of going back to all the people in his files and really working with them for a change, serving them the way he thought they should be served. And that year he wrote an additional $700,000 of insurance and joined the Million Dollar Roundtable for the first time. He found he no longer had to approach coal prospects by working with the people he had already sold, the people he knew. And on their referrals he found acres of diamonds right in his filing cabinet. A man from a small town amassed a fortune starting with a single service station. In the beginning, when things were tough, he would ask himself each morning, What can I do to increase my service to my customers? You see, he had the key. What can I do to increase my service to my customers? 
Well, he's retired now, and his son and daughter head the large complex enterprise that all started with a small service station and a daily question that will virtually guarantee success in any undertaking. What can I do to increase my service to my customers? Answer that question in constantly new and better ways, and sales and profits will take care of themselves. Do you know what the so-called average person would have done in the case I just mentioned? He or she would have been worried about how bad business was, because in the beginning my friend had a hard time just feeding his family. When one day a man drove into the station in a big shiny car, the so-called average man, seeing what he presumed to be a wealthy customer, would have said to himself, I ought to be in his business instead of mine. See, the average person believes some businesses are better than others instead of realizing the truth that there are no bad businesses. There are just those people who don't know enough to see the opportunities in the work they're in. No matter what our work happens to be, it's our business. We're the manager. If there seems to be no future or opportunity in it, it isn't always because it's not there, but perhaps only because we can't see it. A farmer once poked a tiny pumpkin into an empty jug, just for fun, and the pumpkin grew until it completely filled the jug and then could grow no more, and finally, when the farmer broke the glass jug, he had a pumpkin exactly the size and shape of the gallon jug. Now, if we're not careful, each of us can do a similar thing. We can mistakenly poke ourselves into jugs that limit our growth. But it's we who do the poking, not the job, not the company, nor the area, nor the economy, nor the times. We do it. We should avoid such self-restriction and realize there's virtually no limit to our growth and development on the land upon which we now find ourselves with our roots deep in the soil of a working philosophy of life such as the one offered by this program and our minds and bodies in the climate of freedom. People who become outstanding at their work are those who see their work as an opportunity for growth and development and who prepare themselves for the opportunities which surround them every day. It was J.B. Matthews who wrote, Unless a man has trained himself for his chance, the chance will only make him ridiculous. A great occasion is worth to a man exactly what his preparation enables him to make of it. Preparation is the key. This means becoming so good, so competent at what we're now doing, we'll actually force the opportunities we seek to come our way. It takes imagination, creative imagination, to know that diamonds don't look like diamonds in their rough state, nor does a pile of iron ore look like iron or steel. Great opportunities lurk constantly in every aspect of the work in which we now find ourselves. In order to begin prospecting your acres of diamonds, start to develop a faculty called intelligent objectivity, the ability to stand off and look at your job as a stranger might, a stranger who considers your pasture greener than his own. To do this, start at the beginning. Within the framework of what industry or profession does your job fall? Do you know all you can know about your industry? How did it begin? What did it begin? Who started it? When? What is your industry's annual dollar volume? How fast has it grown during the past 20 years? What's its projected growth during the next 10 years? Do you know that many industries will double in size during the next 8 years? This takes only about a 10% gain per year. In short, start now to become a student of your industry. You'll be amazed at the results. In five years or less, you can become a national expert in your field, and it's the experts who write their own tickets in life. Just think of this for a moment. If you can see no limit to the growth of your own industry, doesn't it make sense to realize that there's no limit as to how far you can progress within its framework? Surveys indicate that the great majority of people seem to look at their jobs as being as far as they can go as the end of the line. Why? They need to realize how really desperately an expanding and dynamic industry needs and seeks the uncommon person who is prepared to share in its growth, how richly it will reward this person of vision and action. On the other hand, those who are not preparing and growing are not just standing still in relation to their industry. They're going backwards. So ask yourself, do I know as much about my job and my industry as a good doctor or lawyer knows about his job, his profession? You should, you know. This is the attitude of the person who wants to become a professional at what he or she does for a living. It's far more fun, many times more rewarding and interesting, and the real pro can ride out occasional storms in economic seas in a 
safe boat built of research and preparation. In order to become a professional in a world of amateurs, we need to study three important subjects. One, our company and the industry in which it operates. Two, our job and perhaps the next step upward in our career. And three, we need to study people, since successfully serving and getting along with people will determine our success or failure. These are three subjects on which you can gradually build a fine home library. Your bookstore dealer will help you find the right books if you'll tell him what you want to know, and of course you can find much excellent material on tape cassettes. Frequently all you need in order to make an enormous improvement is simply a reminder of things you've known but have forgotten. Perhaps this study and research in your job, your industry, and ways of increasing your service to others sounds like a big job. Well, it is. But it's fun, and it's fascinating. In the long run, it pays tremendous dividends, builds complete security. And it can be accomplished in an hour a day devoted to reading and making permanent notes. Studying one book or one article at a time, an hour each day, or listening to a tape cassette in your car will lead to your becoming an expert at your particular job and industry in five years or less. The hours add up, one at a time, like the great stones of a pyramid, building a strong and permanent foundation which raises you a layer at a time toward that goal you seek. Each morning as you get ready for work, ask yourself that super question. How can I increase my service today? Then, during the hour a day you set aside for study and research, make notes and think about your industry, about your job, your company, about people. You'll gradually begin to get better and better ideas for improving your service. And remember the words that no person can become rich without enriching others. Anyone who adds to prosperity must prosper in turn. Think of ways and means by which you can increase your contribution to your company, your industry, and those whom you serve. You begin to notice a wonderful change in your world, for as you sow, so shall you reap. This applies just as much to the worker on the production line as it does to the executive in the office. The minute you adopt this attitude, you've joined the top 5% of the people of the world. You've virtually removed all competition. You're creating rather than competing. You're affecting life rather than just being affected by it. You're becoming a creator and a giver to life instead of just a receiver. By taking this attitude toward your work, your company, and industry, you're automatically taking care of two vital parts of successful living. First, you'll find yourself becoming more interested and enthusiastic about your work and its future, and both interest and enthusiasm are contagious. Secondly, you're building financial security which will last a lifetime, so keep this thought in mind as often as you can on and off the job. Somewhere in your present work, there lurks an opportunity which will bring you everything you could possibly want. It will not be labeled opportunity. It will be hidden in common everyday garments, just as was the hairpin with which a man fashioned the first paper clip, or the dirty drinking glass which triggered the paper cup industry. Now in closing, here are 12 points to remember. One, if we'll develop the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we will very likely find it contains the riches, tangible and intangible, we seek. Two, before we go running off into what we think are greener pastures, let's realize our own pastures is probably unlimited. Three, there are no bad jobs. It's the way in which we go about our work that makes it good or bad. Four, let's not poke ourselves into jugs beyond which we cannot grow. Let's avoid self-limitation. Five, only preparation can ensure our taking advantage of the opportunities which will present themselves in the future, opportunities which are around us now. Let's begin to prepare now. Six, put your imagination to work on the many ways and means of improving what you're now doing. Seven, learn all you can about your job, your company, and your industry. Eight, since there's no limit to the growth of your industry, it must follow there's similarly no limit to your own growth potential within that industry. Nine, our dynamic and growing economy needs and will well reward the uncommon person who prepares for a place in its growth. Ten, 
Begin to build your library of reference material pertaining to your company, industry, job, and on how to better serve and get along with people. Most especially, as millions are doing today, turn your automobile into a learning center. Listen to tape cassettes as you drive along. 11. Set aside an hour a day for this study and research, and 12. Remember the story of the Acres of Diamonds.